Let's learn how to work with Anaconda for Python on a Windows computer. If you're new to Anaconda, I have a previous video that explains what it is and why you might want to use it if you're developing in Python. This video is just going to focus on the procedures of working with it. So step one, you want to go to anaconda.com forward slash download and download a copy of the Anaconda distribution. With the download complete, I'm now looking at my downloads folder and I can see the Anaconda installer. So I'll double click that to get started. I'll click next on the welcome screen. I'll agree to the license agreement. You can choose to install this for just the currently logged in users or all users on your computer. I'm going to go with option one. For the install location, I'll just leave it as the default path they specify. And for advanced installation options, I'm going to make sure I check the second option to add Anaconda 3 to my path environment variable. Now this is going to say it's not recommended, can lead to conflicts with other applications. Uh, instead, they recommend using Command Prompt or PowerShell. Um, this is not my recommendation. There are other command line programs I recommend using when doing development on Windows. And so within those environments, we want to make sure we have Anaconda accessible. So I want to check that off. Uh, and in, in a moment, once we get past the Anaconda installation, I'll talk more about the command line program that I recommend. But make sure you check this off at this point. You can leave all the others as the defaults, and then we'll proceed with the installation. Installation is complete, so I'll click Next again. Here they're promoting the ability to work with Anaconda and Jupyter Notebooks on the web, which is not something we need, so we're going to click Next. And then on this final screen, I'm going to uncheck this uh, information about getting started with Anaconda, but I do want to launch the Anaconda Navigator, so I'll leave that checked and click Finish. And it's going to go through the process of starting up the Anaconda Navigator. It may prompt you to update the Navigator at this point, which I recommend doing. In the interest of time, I'm just going to say No, Remind Me Later. And that finally leads me to the Anaconda Navigator, which is just their visual interface for working with some of the features that Anaconda provides. For example, here in the home section, we can see a list of programs that came bundled with Anaconda. So if we wanted to, uh, for example, get into Jupyter Notebooks, we could launch that directly from here. If we were looking for a code editor, uh, we could play around with Spider. This is a popular code editor in the world of scientific programming. Uh, if we wanted a more general purpose code editor, we could use VS Code, um, which is actually what I'll be using in this video. But uh, at the end of the day, you can really use any code editor if there's one you're already familiar with. You don't have to use the code editors that are mentioned here. Uh, so take a moment just to skim through what programs are available, but I want to really focus in on environments, which is just a key part of working with Anaconda. To understand environments, I want to pull up a graphic from the video I did leading up to this one where I explained that environments are like these isolated workspaces you can create that are customized for the projects you're working on. For example, if you have a, say, game development project you're working on in Python, that's going to require a whole set of packages that's going to be very different than the packages you would be using in, say, a data science project. So environments or these isolated workspaces allow you to accommodate that, to have these separate containers where you could do your work, pull in just the software you need, and really customize it to meet the needs of that project. Uh, now, by default, when you get started with Anaconda, you have this base or root environment that's going to include a whole bunch of uh, scientific computed related packages. So that might be a good place to start if you are working in the field of scientific computing, whether it be data science, machine learning, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but generally speaking, I recommend starting with a new empty environment and just pulling in the packages you need as you're working with them. All right, so that's the path we're going to take. And we could just go down here and create the environment directly in the navigator. But I actually want to, uh, to switch us over to command line and learn how to do it there using a command line based program called Conda that comes with Anaconda. Now, the reason I want to show you this is because as programmers, we spend a lot of time in command line, and that's often because command line tools can provide us some more robust options than we can get in point and click interfaces like Navigator. So it's just good to be comfortable with the command line based tools. You're going to be spending a lot of time in command line anyway, so I really want to transition over to that. Now, in order to do that, we're going to need a good command line program to work with. And there's some default programs that Windows comes with, things like PowerShell or just their general command prompt. But I recommend getting set up with a Unix-based command line program. Um, this is going to make it so that the commands you're running are going to be the same whether you're on Windows or a Linux-based operating system or even a Mac-based operating system. It's just going to make things more universal. You're going to find a lot of instruction and tutorials online or geared towards Unix-based command line programs. So I recommend taking the time to get that set up if you're developing on Windows. 
Um, there's a few different ways you could do that. One way is you could set up something called uh, the Linux subsystem for Windows. It basically allows you to run Linux-based programs and Unix-based command line programs on Windows. That's a little more advanced. So the alternative option that I really like is uh, downloading Git Bash. So here in my browser, I'm going over to git-scm.com forward slash download forward slash win. And what we're actually downloading is Git, which is a version control program that you're probably going to be using if you're not already using in the world of development. But the reason we're downloading it specifically is because when you download Git, it comes with Git Bash, which is the um, command line program that's going to have those Unix based commands that we're looking for. So long story short, if you don't already have a command line set up, you're not already comfortable with command line, I recommend starting here. So from this download page, just download the appropriate install for your system. In my case, I'm on a 64-bit system, so I'm going to download that. I'm going to open my downloads folder, find the git installer, double click that, give it permissions to make changes on my system, click next. I'm going to leave it as the default install location, click next again. On this component page, I'm going to leave all the default options, but you can skim through there and check off or uncheck what you do or don't want. And if you have any questions about any of these options, you can leave a comment below, but I'm just going to click next. This gives me options for how this is going to appear in my start menu. So I'll leave it as the default Git, click next again. Here we can choose the default code editor used by Git. So from the drop down option, you want to find a code editor you're familiar with. Uh, in my case, I'm going to use VS Code or Visual Studio Code. This screen is asking about default names for new Git branches. Uh, and this is really getting into Git version control, which is not really why we're downloading this program. But I do recommend choosing option two here. So it's going to use this default name of main, which is more common nowadays. So we'll click Next. Here we get to decide where Git is going to be accessible from. I'm going to leave it as the second option. So it's accessible from command line and also from third party software, just in case you have other uh, command line programs you're using, this is going to make sure it's accessible there as well. Now at this point, it's going to start to ask me a bunch of customization options. It's going to ask me what programs I want to use, what defaults, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave it as the defaults for everything. And I'm just going to rapidly click next to go through all of them and just get through this install process. A lot of this stuff is not relevant to the work that we're going to be doing. And if it is relevant to things you want to do with Git or Git Bash, it's always things you can customize later. All right, so knowing that, like I said, I'm just going to fast forward and just click next to these several screens. And now it's going to get to the actual install process, so I'll give that a moment to finish. So that's done. I'm going to check off launch git bash and uh, disable release notes. We don't need to look at that. And there we go. Installation is complete. And this is our git bash window where we're going to do all of our command line work. Let me minimize my browser so we can focus in on this. And I'm going to make my font a little bit bigger so we can see the commands better. So I'm just right clicking and going to options and then to text. I'm going to select the current font and let's bump this up to 20 pixels. And I'll save those changes. And the first command we're going to run is conda init bash. This is going to do two things. One, if it finds the command conda, it shows that everything is installed correctly. And then the init bash part of it is just going to make conda uh, initialize basically to be running within this git bash environment. So let's run that. When that's done, we're told to make the changes take effect. We have to close and reopen our current shell. So I'll close git bash and then I'll reopen it by just searching for it. And one thing we will observe now is that our prompt is prefixed with this name base, which is the name of the current Anaconda environment we're working in. All right, and if we go back to the Anaconda Navigator, this correlates with what we saw here. We saw we had this base environment. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to create a new environment that we can customize. So to do that, I'm going to use the command conda create. I'm going to include the name flag and give my new environment a name. I'm just going to call it demo. I'll type Y and hit enter when it asks me to proceed. And then when that's done, I'm told I can activate that current environment with the conda activate command. So we're going to say conda activate demo. And you can see now my prompt is prefixed with the name of that environment, just reminding me I'm currently working in the demo environment. All right, so now that I'm in this environment, the first thing I want to do is install Python. We're going to say conda install, followed by the package name. In this case, that's simply just Python. Once again, I'll type Y and hit enter to proceed. 
And then just to confirm that worked as expected, if I run the command conda list, it's going to tell me all of the packages currently installed. So we see Python listed here. Um, we can see it got the latest version as of this recording, which is 3.12.1. Um, if for some reason we wanted an older version of Python, we could have included that as part of our uh, install command. Um, I have a bunch of other packages installed here as well. Uh, these are basically sub-dependencies of Python. So when we installed Python, we got these packages as well. Another interesting thing I could do at this point to just highlight how environments work is I'm going to run the command which Python. And this is going to locate which install of Python is going to be invoked when I'm working in this command line window. All right, and you can see it's locating it within my Anaconda 3 directory under ins or environments under demo and Python. Uh, similarly, if I ask it to tell me what version of Python I'm currently working with in this demo environment, you could see it's reporting back 3.12.1, which as we saw a moment ago matches up. Now watch what happens. Let's go conda deactivate. What that's going to do is it's going to get me out of this demo environment. All right now I'm back in the base environment and let's run those same commands again. So I'm going to say which Python and now it's pointing to a different directory. It is still within the Anaconda 3, but there's this like global install of Python there that's available to this base directory. If we check out the version number here, it's actually an older version of Python. It's 3.11.5. All right, so hopefully you can see how you can be in different environments and run completely separate programs as well as just separate versions of programs. Right. Now, in our case, though, we do want to be working in that demo environment. So let's get back into there. We're going to say conda activate demo again. And now working in the context of this environment, let's create and run our first Python script. To do this, I'm going to switch over to my code editor I'm using VS Code, but you can do this in any code editor. I'm just going to create a new text file and let's save it. I'm just going to put it on my desktop. I'll call it demo.py. Anytime you're creating Python files, they're always going to end with a .py extension. And we'll start off real simple. I'm just going to invoke the print command and we're going to say hello world. I'm going to save the changes to that file, go back to git bash, and then um, I need to move into the directory where I created that file. So I could do that with the change directory command. And to get to my home directory, I could just use the tilde forward slash shortcut. And then we're going into the desktop. Um, and if I look at the directory contents using the list command or ls command, I should see that demo.py uh, file that I had created. And to run this, we're just going to invoke Python followed by the name of that file. And perfect, there's our print output just demonstrating that we have Python installed in this environment and we're able to run our first script. Uh, but let's make this a little bit more interesting. I'm going to go over to the notes that accompany this video. I have an example program we could uh, play around with. It's under this uh, heading of run example program. There's a bunch of code. Let's copy this and bring it into our demo.py uh, file. And if you skim through this code quickly, what it's doing is it is making a request to accuweather.com for the uh, weather information for a given location. And then using Python, it parses out the current temperature from that information and prints it to the console. All right, so just a simple uh, basic Python example. But the reason I put this together is because if we look at the top, you can see it's using two external packages. The first is called requests. This is what's used to make the request to accuweather.com. And then the second package is called beautiful soup. This is what's actually parsing the results to extract just the temperature. All right, and this is a very common setup you're gonna see in your Python files where at the top, you're pulling in some external packages and then you follow that up with Python code that you write that works with those packages. Now, if I attempt to run this right now, it's actually gonna fail because I haven't actually pulled in these packages into my current environment. And just to show that, let me bring back git bash, we'll run our demo.py file again, and we're getting an error about no module named requests. All right, so to address that, we need to make sure we install those two packages just like we did Python. So I'm going to say conda install, starting with the request package. And then we'll also do conda install beautiful soup. And it's technically uh, the version we're getting here is beautiful soup 4. So that's the name I'm going to use. And while that's installing, I will mention these package names. I'm just pulling off the top of my head and from that demo script I had set up. But um, where I'm getting these names is there are like master repositories of packages that we can pull from. Uh, if you want to browse what packages are available for Conda, there's a repository called Conda Forge. So you can go there and search for packages. 
Uh, you also have access to pip packages. Pip is a um, another Python package manager that's very popular, and you can use that in conjunction with Conda. So any of the packages you would find via the pip repository are available. So that's how you go about finding packages you're looking for. Or more often, if you're just looking up how to do something in Python, you're going to come across tutorials and guides that say, oh, use this package. And then you can check those repositories and make sure it exists and make sure you're referencing them by the correct name. All right, but returning back to our example, we should have our two external packages that we need to uh, confirm that. Let's just run conda list again. And looking at the output, we can see we've got that request package added to the list as well as that beautiful soup package. All right, so now let's try to run our script again. And perfect, there is our temperature pulling live from accuweather.com. Looks like the degree symbol is not displaying correctly, but that's a minor point. The main thing is it is able to make that request and parse the results using those two external packages. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up this example. Hopefully this got you on track for working with Anaconda on a uh, Windows system. And along the way, we also got set up with Git Bash. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is just a note. If you go to the uh, notes that accompany this video, at the very end is a quick reference guide to common conda commands you're going to find yourself reaching for. So go ahead and bookmark that. And if there's any problems with any of the techniques or procedures I've shown in this video, you can leave a comment below and I can help you troubleshoot.